Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session of the World Health Summit. My name is Eckhart Hirschhausen. I'm the founder of Healthy Planet Healthy People Foundation. And I'm very happy to focus on this session on uh, the part of communication, because uh, citing data turn back, uh, we are seeing a lot of conferences. We're ahead of Glasgow, the COP26, and we have a lot of global health is so important, but when we are honest to ourselves, <laughs> to the state of the world, we are in a mess. We are in the middle of a climate catastrophe, many things in public health that have been going up, going in the right direction for um, two decades now, are uh, declining, are getting worse. And um, Paul Watzavik, one of the biggest pioneers in communication said, if something doesn't work, do something different. So the big question for this uh, talk is, what can we do differently? How can we, um, yeah, support the transition from scientific knowledge to political leadership in the eye of, yeah, of the suicide of mankind, to put it bluntly. And uh, there's so much wisdom and knowledge in the room. And uh, I often have the impression that, that political decisions are made completely dis um, disparate from, from what the science says. And COVID-19 has given us a great opportunity to teach us one big lesson that global means here. That's one of the slogans that we use at Healthy Planet, Healthy People, because so far global health, I, I was um, raised and educated in Germany as a medical doctor, global health always meant somewhere else. <laughs> it meant basically the subline was, well, there. there they are suffering people, they are poor people somewhere in the world, but don't bother. It, it, if, if you're a good human being, you, you can care a bit about them, but it, it's not really an issue. I, I, I want to be direct. We're talking about communication. So the, the, the question is, has COVID-19 given us the chance to turn this around, to tell each one in the rich countries that our health depends on the health of other people on this planet and that we are one community and the a virus doesn't care if you're a human being or an animal to start with. <laughs> a virus doesn't care if you have a passport, if there's a border drawn between the, this recipient of the virus and the next. A virus doesn't care if you have a health insurance and a CO2 molecule in the air doesn't care which country emitted this particular molecule and at all the conference we're dealing, oh, that this is uh, this and this is that and uh, our silos and our ways of dealing with problems are in no way adequate to the complexity of the problem we are facing now. I've just written a book called Mensch Erde, wir könnten es so schön haben, saying, well, <laughs> Mother Earth, we could have such a good time if we didn't mess it up and on the, on the um, cover, there's a button saying three crises for the price of two, like a, like a marketing uh, joke, but we're having more crises that we can deal with. And we have the institutions and Paula to start with you before I introduce the panel uh, in Australia and on the Philippines to have a really global perspective. Uh, when I was listening to your talk at the Planetary Health Academy, um, you said <laughs> big um, problems always start with an I. What do you mean by that? Institutions and uh, yeah, institutions and well, good morning. Uh, good morning, Paula. Good evening. Good afternoon. Uh, it's and, and hello to everybody watching us online. It's great that I think that we can have a chance to do things differently. We can connect much more with the crisis. So um, just a little bit of um, institutions. I will go back to you uh, in a second, but it's interesting that here we're talking about two um, important topics that I am passionate about, which is planetary health and communication. And unfortunately, we have seen how much of this, uh, of the communications that has been perhaps neglected, because we keep talking about this for uh, so many decades, right? Um, and it's essential, so we're really talking about uh, lives. But um, if we go back to our challenge, so how do we communicate even, you know, uh, among ourselves here? It's like, normally we will have a disinterest, or people don't have the ability to listen, right? M maybe in Germany it's different, because they have two ways 
wait for the, the verb at the end. That's what we learn when we are uh, <laughs> learning German. So they may be, I'm from Brazil. So we are, uh, it's more e easier perhaps to interrupt. Um, <laughs> so if you have also people, different languages, different culture styles, uh, you can also experience that uh, if you have an intercultural marriage, for example. Very difficult communication, uh, right? But uh, are you what, married to a German? So can you imagine? It's a very difficult. <laughs> so every day I experience the exercise of communication, uh, and when they try to translate things, doesn't you know? Not always work. So I think as a transposing this, what does it mean for uh, our crisis uh, of the planetary health crisis? That we are here to uh, the problems that I was pointing when we discussed, but we are here because we have basically four uh, major challenges, right? With the global pandemic, but as you're saying, perhaps. Perhaps we should call it a syndemic, right? There's so many mm -hmm. crises together. Mm -hmm. There was this discussion. Oh, the triple crisis. It's so many crises. So of course it's overwhelming, um, and we have the uh, crisis of inequalities. And I'm, I'm at least happy that we are emphasizing this a bit more. I was here yesterday and there was uh, every panel uh, emphasizing the crisis of inequality. We cannot deal with this with this rising uh, differences uh, among global and south and also within our societies, and we have the topic of today, unprecedented ecological crisis. Um, and finally, uh, the diminished trust in science. So all these are together, right? We cannot solve these uh, problems without having the syndemic, without um, um, communication, which as I said, has been uh, overlooked. Um, but um, why do we have forums like this? And I think that's one of the important, like not doing things differently, but we are here because we're tackling this interconnected crisis, but we need to connect these communities. We have to bridge this uh, community. And it's very interesting. We started already. I have a question. How many times we heard the word uh, silo since you arrived here? I don't know. Can you, anybody? It's many times you heard that. So I also got motivated and I said, oh, I need to write a book that I just, wrote somebody called breaking the silos for planetary health yeah. uh, and but the, the 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 frustrating part is that we're not going to get over silos right uh, that's we we need them to um because we need uh, specifics right we, we still need to be focused on certain areas but we need to be aware of them and i think we are here in communities like that we're here to have this frank dialogue uh, uh, to to identify where the the iis the institutions the ideas and so to cross pollinating uh, different ideas for example when we talk about health the message is simple right we talk about there there are no healthy people in a sick planet but um, there are four main key elements to that. We need to be inclusive. We need to be diverse, uh, have a diverse leadership to communicate that. That's what we need to do differently because in the rooms, we are usually with the same people, with the same, perhaps white male, uh, same age, communicating these things. Uh, and when we are uh, more inclusive uh, and also, of course, um, trying to be, and I heard yesterday there was a panel on interdisciplinary knowledge. How do we um, be solution oriented in our research? Because we're very good mm. to uh, track uh, all the problems in the world. And we, we need to do that. Why? Because we don't want to also reproduce. And you know, when you don't identify the right uh, problem, you don't, cannot find the right solution. But finally, um, besides being inclusive, uh, solution oriented, and you also need to take care of the timing. And that's why I think also connects what you're saying. We are here and it's the right time. But we do have a window of opportunity to bring planetary health into a global health discussion uh, even more. But this window, of, we cannot also, it cannot be wishful thinking. We cannot just, you know, imagine that this window of opportunity could be closing and we need to act uh, very fast. So I'm sure we can go more in details once we. we Thank you, and Nicole de Paula, your women's uh, leaders for planetary health and the executive director and founder. And you're working at the Töpfer Institute at the IAAS here in Potsdam. Exactly. To complete the communication. Over to Renzo. Renzo, you're uh, at the St. Luke's College of Medicine. Renzo Ginto, Professor, Planetary and Global Health Program. And um, we met uh, recently at the HIV convention. And I remember uh, you with a very drastic example of, of triple crisis. You said uh, we have uh, the coronavirus, we have HIV, we have uh, flooding. And uh, coronavirus asks us to uh, put people on uh, on a uh, on separation to to keep distance from each other. But when you have a flood coming, everybody gets into the shelter and is really close to each other. What, what crisis gets the, the most attention? So um, Renzo, over to you. What, what do you think is is uh, 
is the most urgent issue that we should communicate in planetary health? Sure. Well, first and foremost, thank you very much uh, to the World Health Summit for this opportunity. And it's glad to be uh, meeting you again or e-meeting you again, Eckhart, and also to be with my comrade uh, Nicole and also Tony Capon, who is one of my personal role models and inspiration in the planetary health movement. So it's really a privilege to be uh, joining you, albeit virtually. Uh, I, I definitely miss Berlin. Uh, the last time I was in Berlin was World Health Summit 2019. And I'm not sure if our colleagues in the room still remember the uh, discussions at the World Health Summit 2019 when we actually gave tribute to Alexander von Humboldt, who is who I you know who is the person that I consider as one of the first planetary health physicians uh, or doctors. He's not a physician, but you know with the, his work in ecology and, and ecosystems, I think um, he is he should be considered as one of the. Uh, founding fathers of planetary health, uh, but also a very good communicator. If you remember, he's written a lot about um, you know the, uh, the the beauty of of the planet, but also the crisis. You're you're referring to the crisis that uh, the Philippines has been experiencing in many other places. He he was the first one or one of the first to actually call attention uh, to the emerging issue then of climate change. I remember he was even describing uh, how the noxious fumes are contributing to the destabilization of the atmosphere. Fast forward, you know, yeah. in two weeks time, yeah. we will be, sorry, go ahead. Okay. No, no. In, in, okay, in two weeks time, we will be negotiating again for the 26th time <laughs> on how to stabilize the climate. Um, and, and so, you know, when, when we, because our session is about communication, um, I think, you know, three points, we need to know what to communicate. We need to know, how do we communicate it, especially in the digital age, social media, of course, the Philippines is a social media capital of the world. And so we've really made sure that uh, we combat misinformation uh, and, and uh, saturate it with uh, healthy messages, you know, planetary health uh, oriented uh, information. But also, I think we should be talking about how do we communicate through our actions by role modeling, because it's not enough to be communicating about both the crisis but also the solutions without really walking the talk um, and 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 showing how planetary health can, can uh, planetary health change can can occur and so you know in a place like the Philippines I always say the Philippines is at the heart of planetary health not just because they both start with PH Philippines and planetary health but it's really at the heart of the climate crisis twenty typhoons each year now increasing in severity and frequency. But also the Philippines, along with, it, with its other uh, Southeast Asian neighbors, can be the ground zero for the next pandemic if we don't get our acts together, if we continue to destroy our forests, our natural ecosystems. You know, the next pathogen is just lurking uh, around, you know, in the jungles of the Philippines or a poultry farm uh, in, in another country. And so we really need to um, highlight uh, these interconnected issues, especially in this part of the world. And, but also, you know, not just to paint a bleak picture that all these problems, uh, this crisis, uh, will be happening in the Philippines, in Southeast Asia. You know, I always say that in the US, there's this place called Silicon Valley, which is the epicenter of technological innovation. And the way we communicate planetary health here in the Philippines is we want the Philippines to be the Silicon Islands of planetary health innovation. You know, uh, there are 7,000 islands and we definitely um, have, have a firm belief and faith in the potential of places like the Philippines in really driving uh, positive uh, planetary health change. Um, you know, and, and for the past year, you know, during this pandemic, we've done uh, a lot of efforts and activities in trying to promote planetary health. Planetary health may sound new to many people, but actually it's also an old idea. It's already embedded in many of our cultures, this acknowledgement that the health of the planet and the health of the people are inextricably intertwined. And in the Philippines, over the past year, we've built the first planetary health program at the St. Luke's Medical Center, College of Medicine. And then just this year, um, we also launched a new Sunway Center for Planetary Health in Malaysia, where I serve as the chief planetary health scientist. And so two out of the 10 Southeast Asian countries already have planetary health programs, centers, and we hope to build more in the years to come in our neighboring uh, parts of uh, you know, the, the, the region. Finally, uh, and for sure later on, I can share more information about these uh, 
infrastructure for planetary health system change that we are building in this part of the world. I think we need to, um, you know, uh, start having a decolonial and a democratized conversation about planetary health. I and I really like that the the fact that uh, albeit virtually we are part of this conversation that is happening in Berlin. Uh, but hopefully, in future dialogues about the future of planetary health, we try to bring as many voices as we as we can. Uh, women and children, uh, the indigenous voices, uh, people from the global south who are doing planetary health change in ways big and small in the places uh, where they belong to. You know, not changes happening in Geneva, not in Berlin, but in the front lines of the planetary health crisis, climate change, biodiversity loss, and an increasingly uh, at risk uh, planet for future pandemics. I'll stop there for now and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thanks uh, from from ground zero to the Silicon Valley. I, ho I hope you, you will be the, the last. Uh, now over to Professor Tony Capen. You've been introduced as a role model. <laughs> Does it make you proud, Tony? Oh, it's very generous uh, of Renzo. And uh, for me, it's a great honor to, to be with you uh, today, coming here from Wurundjeri country. Uh, here in Melbourne, Australia. And uh, I think I'd build on the previous remarks um, uh, made by um, uh, my colleagues, Nicole and Renzo. Um, in some countries, in fact, Australia included, uh, climate change denial has actually been a major barrier to progress. And uh, Naomi Oreski and uh, uh, Eric Conway wrote about this in their 2010 book, uh, Merchants of Doubt. And indeed, this is, at a health conference, we must remember that this is just as relevant to tobacco and the history of tobacco control as it is to action on climate change. So here what we see is contrarian scientists partnering with conservative think tanks and private corporations to keep controversy alive, to sow doubt. And we've also seen this enabled by some of our media organizations, uh, Fox, for example. In Australia, since 2017, we've had six different prime ministers. That's a very quick turnover in our country. And uh, this is described as wars in relation to climate. So we've lost at least a decade uh, uh, in terms of progress in Australia. When we think about successful communication, it's about finding a narrative that is firstly understood, secondly believed, and importantly uh, trusted. The narrative must fit with the identity of the target audience and their values. It must validate who they are and what they aspire to be. In Australia, the historical narrative is about a resource-rich country, uh, a frontier people, if you like, with an economy based on coal and iron ore exports. Up to this point, the mining lobby has had vested interest in maintaining that narrative. However, uh, in the last couple of years, a new narrative is emerging. And this new narrative is about Australia as a renewable energy superpower. This plays to Australians' view of themselves as earlier adopters of new technologies. And one of our best economists, Ross Garno, is advancing this new narrative. It's gaining traction, even in regions that are traditionally dependent on coal mining and coal exports. And indeed, there are new mining opportunities that align with this new narrative, because we need minerals for the transition to renewable energy, such as lithium. But it's not just the message. The messenger is also important. And here's where doctors and nurses come in, because uh, doctors and nurses are trusted sources of information. And the health lens on climate change is helpful for three important reasons for urgency, 
personal stories and positive stories. The health view on climate change helps us understand that climate change is not a future abstract problem. It's already happening and it's already affecting our health. So it helps us with the urgency. The health narrative also helps bring human stories to people, real people being affected by climate change, personal stories of these effects. And thirdly, those positive stories about the health co-benefits from the sustainability transitions that we need to get on with, whether it's renewable energy, plant-rich diets, active mobility. As I conclude these opening remarks, I'd like to just quickly share the screen with you because I've got two images here that I wanted to show. This first image, takes us back to the 2019-2020 bushfires here in Australia. It's an image from the ABC website, our major public broadcaster. Alison Marion took this photo of her son, Finn Burns, as he was piloting a tinny to help his family escape from those bushfires here in Australia. It's an arresting image and a stark reminder of those devastating bushfires. Those fires demonstrated that the climate's already changed here in Australia. It's affecting our health. There's much to be done. We must act urgently. My second image is from the Philippines, uh, from Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines back in 2013. This is also a really arresting image of health and climate change on the cover of Time magazine. We're not told the name of this woman who's standing among the ruins of Tacloban in the Philippines, but it tells a story in an arresting way. My point here is that communication about health and climate, about planetary health issues, doesn't only have to be about good quality data presented in compelling tables and charts. Sometimes a single image like this can really cut through. It's not just about rational thinking, it's also about engaging emotionally with these really critical issues. So back to you uh, in Berlin now. Uh, thank you very much. I couldn't agree more with what you've just said, that we have to be really more keen on what is the story we want to tell and what is the positive outcome that we could aim for, because many of the crisis communication has psychologically the effect of, of, uh, yeah, of panicking, and then we shut off our rational and cognitive and creative thinking above all. And we are just in the mood of survival and fight or flight. And uh, especially you turn uh, from a communicative person into a very egoistic person, just thinking about how do I save my ass? And uh, what you just said about the role of health professionals, uh, we, we were supposed not to use slides, but I think <laughs> this one is even impressive from uh, far away. Um, this is directly to Australia. This is trust in professions. You have this uh, list all over the world. It's um, the lowest key of existence is a politician. So this is in the red zone. And then you have people in commercials, you have insurance uh, people. And up here are firemen, uh, nurses, uh, emergency uh, doctors, and all the people who are really working where it's at. And uh, talking about firemen and, and um, other health professionals, pharmacists and stuff, these are in the highly green, in the highly respected area of communication. And we are not using them as multiplicators of crisis communication so far. And there, there's one story that um, uh, went viral that I really love and I quote in every uh, lecture I give of a fireman in Australia 
And uh, he was approached by the uh, Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, who is really um, doing a lot of damage to uh, <laughs> global health through uh, his coal policy. And he wanted to have a nice picture in front of a burning wood um, with the firemen. And the firemen refused the handshake of the prime minister and said the golden words, prime minister, at the end of a fireman's tube, you will never find a climate skeptic. And this was the quote that went viral. And I think this is so important to each one of us because we are here at the health silo at the health bubble, that uh, we include the people who are witnessing the effects much more in the communication. And Paula, you said we have a lot of research and research goes more into detail, more into um, uh, more problems. And uh, rarely communication as a tool, as a drug, so to speak, is evaluated in its effectiveness. We have a great way of evaluating if a drug is worthwhile with the controlled trial, but communication is always uh, taken for granted that there's no science behind it, how we approach. And what Tony just said is that uh, these images and the, the way we use emotions in a communication is really badly understood by scientists. And one of my personal heroes is uh, George Marshall from uh, Climate Outreach in Oxford, a think tank. And he, he was advising the, the Guardian and saying, uh, stop using polar bears in your imagery. Stop <laughs> using them as the prime victims of climate change. Put across the idea that they're human beings suffering, that like the Lancet Climate Countdown said, uh, the climate crisis is the biggest health threat in the 21st century. And we just had in Germany this uh, flooding, which in one night only killed 200 people and uh, caused a damage of 30 billion uh, euro. And this, for me, is together with COVID, the turning point, the social tipping point that many people and even the politicians in Germany can't look away. The, Tony said that, that the climate denial follows a certain yeah, history. And I highly recommend the movie and the book, uh, Merchants of Doubt. And um, if you're not familiar, unfortunately, we can't write it in the notes, but uh, you will find it uh, easily. Um, or on the positive side, I recommend the Netflix series that David Attenborough did with uh, uh, Johann Rockström. So these are positive examples of how you can talk about something really difficult to grasp, like planetary boundaries, in a way that reaches millions of people, and <laughs> there are not that many readers of Lancet reports, to be blunt, but uh, there are many users of Netflix. So uh, do you have a positive example of how we can use health professionals, and especially women, um, in, in the way that we are not having used so far? That's so interesting because you mentioned the book Merchants of Doubt, as and it is a key uh, when you read that you read by a woman. Yes, a very exactly. It was a, a very important uh, reflection and bringing all this vested interest, right? We, uh, despite the politicians being, you know, the least trusted, we, it's very hard to move forward without them. So we need <laughs> to do this. Uh, we need to include them, and uh, and that's a very uh, important point. So on the, I, I like. I think we were together perhaps uh, here in Germany. There was the Silber Zas. Uh, festival, film mm -hmm. festival, yeah. on, uh, and I was there in the jury of uh, films communicating uh, science. So there is a whole um, group of people, of science communicators, of course, uh, you have a very important role here. I wish the Brazil had more space on TV to talk about planetary health. That's telenovela. Still not, still you have to happening. have a telenovela. With Maybe it. I need to be the, I don't know, create a new soap opera on planetary health. Renzo, I'll invite you, Tony, we're all going to be stars in Brazil because that will be a, a way I had a Russian friend who spoke Portuguese just by the novellas. But the important thing is, uh, now that you mentioned the novellas actually bring a lot of knowledge. They started to understand globalization through these novellas. You know, they went to yeah. other countries. So we shouldn't also, it's not about making fun. Right? No, you, you know what the prime example is? Uh, emergency room with John Clooney. Um, they suddenly understood that they're reaching part of the American population that is not reading uh, health informations on the websites. 
and then they started uh, deliberately to include uh, topics like HIV, topics like uh, alcoholism, drug abuse, infectious diseases, on uh, in the telenovela in in the in the series. Yeah. And uh, so I think uh, that this uh, that that fiction has a very important role to play is something that we have to realize that uh, if you want to get a message across for planetary health and the emergency and, and the urgency to act, uh, use fiction in, in, a, in a way that you're reaching people who have a vote who will determine about what the politicians think is important. So- um, This the, the, is an important the, example. And I think what I enjoy about planetary health because it's this where the narrative of planetary health is very important, right? We are here to connect. We talk so much about fragmented communities and how we are in silos and all that. But the planetary health to me is really a way to bring these communities together for this uh, global goal of, of being healthy on this planet uh, in the Anthropocene, which we cannot no longer treat human health separately from the planet. Um, but there are many, uh, in terms I also remember uh, when and Renzo mentioned the role model thing. And um, I think I also got tired a little bit of, uh, you write your papers, you go, you can be at the Lancet and you made it for your career, but you're, you realize you're not making a difference because as you go again for the, I'm going to Glasgow and I'll be there. And of course we were, those who were going for decades were saying, oh, is it worth going? Uh, and that's a very dangerous question. And uh, the, the most important conversation that we are having, it's not about a hierarchy, but it's a very important conversation. And we are, oh, should we go? That's not a good sign. Uh, but still, I think we need to, uh, we can, of course, not give up. And the, the, the secret here is also, and we do have ISS is actually having a space there at the COP that I invite all of you, if you're there, on the ISS Reflect COP, which is really bringing, is it the, really the right way that we communicate <laughs> here? So it's a top down, there's a side event. I kind of vomit your uh, my content and my report and go to the next. And politicians are running around on the other side. So uh, that's a, a key concern that we have at ISS as well. And I was very proud that uh, my colleagues are actually uh, um, trying to change. It's the mindset as well as the way of we communicate. So there's so many uh, sides of this conversation here, but on the role modeling thing that I think uh, Renzo mentioned, it was very important that I took the space uh, and the freedom that ISS gave me to create the Women Leaders of Planetary Health. And I realized that sometimes the small little actions, just helping uh, younger women to communicate their ideas uh, on, on the conference, uh, you would make a difference uh, uh, professionally in the future. So we created, we realized that there was a gap also in the conversation. We were a lot about this data. So planetary health uh, community at the beginning, they were interesting also showing more data, right? We need to give, okay, here's our climate change. In fact, we have more diseases and you're <laughs> gonna die from it. So, um, and of course it opened a new, a new field uh, and we are uh, evolving. However, we started to notice how do we, again, the problem of implementation, right? That's where we are dealing with, and that's why we need uh, the whole community. And so the Women Leaders of Planetary Health was a way to kind of connect topics that people were not really, um, I would say not interested, but they were not aware because it's not part of their, let's say, regular lives or concerns. Uh, so we go beyond the science, right? Because what we need is we need the science, we need the capacity building, right? And we need advocacy. Those are the three things. So planetary health is, yes, a science, but it's also the social movement. And I think that's the part that we are uh, enjoying here. And by connecting, even uh, for women, we know we heard yesterday a very powerful talk uh, of the head of UNFPA and uh, how, uh, by the end of this crisis, how lockdowns are disproportionately impacting uh, women. So we were already in a, in a gender crisis. We are missing the SDGs. We're now in a, it's very hard that you, you need the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, but after this crisis, we're a bit farther behind, but who is really farther behind? So there is a, this article in Nature saying how um, men were actually published. They took the time, the lockdown. So, oh, I don't need to go to work. I commute less and, oh, I write more papers at the Lancet. I write more papers uh, in scientific journals. And women, what are you doing? Because of they were first going crazy, second uh, teaching, uh, becoming they were had double journeys. Right now we have a triple journeys because you're homeschooling, so you're all of a sudden school teacher. But this question is when you don't have women in decision making. Uh, uh, so who we're shaping now to get out of this crisis. And we have the same room with the same people. How are we gonna think differently? You talk, how are we gonna communicate different or whatever we need to do different with the same people? So that's why now one of the, my main 
concerns now is how do we change uh, the leadership and just to um, diversity in leadership. And to give a concrete example, uh, I'm also uh, at the steering committee of a global campaign called She Changed Climate. And it's a very important, she changed climate. She changed climate. And uh, I would encourage you, to, you can take a look and it's a very scary, Halloween is coming. So the scary fact uh, <laughs> at the UK um, presidency team, you have two women out of, uh, uh, of 12. So this is the UK. So uh, we're not particularly, a group of women, we're not particularly impressed with gender equality uh, there uh, in the most conversation. And this now it's, a, uh, we had a letter of 400 really top climate uh, women leaders around the world uh, signing and calling for this. And I must say that we got, uh, now there was, um, I think it's a, a deputy in a team uh, appointed. Uh, as, so there was some change. So we cannot just get desperate, right? When you unite, and that's what I like, it's through networks that we can uh, uh, make this change. And see here, we can be in Southeast Asia. I'm from Brazil, we're connecting uh, three continents. Uh, and when you have this diversity, uh, that your impact will be uh, much higher. And it was interesting, you gave the example of the flooding in Germany, right? The science was there. They knew exactly on which street the amount of <laughs> rain would uh, fall. Nobody left their houses, right? So information clearly is yeah, not, and data not the only thing that we need. So this emotion, communications, uh, diversity, and, and bringing communities together is something that I think that we are here for. Talk, talking about the flooding, um, uh, over to Renzo, uh, when uh, Germany was hit by this, we were just really uh, flabbergasted by the fact that we have uh, trillions for basic research but we have not a working system to alert people when there's a flood coming. And uh, ironically, in Bangladesh, people are much more used to flooding and they have a much better warning system than uh, we have in Germany. So uh, Renzo, does planetary health and the communication about it offers a chance of telling new stories what the rich Western world could learn from people who have much less resources and in certain aspects manage, manage much better. Do, do you have an example for this, talking about good communication? Sure, and you know, when um, I, I, you mentioned that in Germany, and of course, I, I definitely uh, sympathize with what's hap with ha what happened to the German people. I have an aunt who's a nurse uh, close to, uh, who's living near Bonn. Uh, who was uh, almost affected, uh, but you know she volunteered and helped in uh, the response uh, efforts. Uh, and and you said you're flabbergasted, but in the Philippines and in many different climate vulnerable countries, when these uh, extreme weather events uh, do occur, we're not feeling uh, being flabbergasted. You know we already are anticipating and and preparing, and uh, this has been part of our reality. I remember in one forum that I attended a few weeks ago um, in, in London, uh, and there was a question, can we just uh, avoid climate related news and photos such as the one shown by Tony uh, to, to pr protect us, ourselves from climate anxiety, you know, to, to, to uh, secure ourselves from being exposed to climate news. And I answered, you know, that is quite an elitist uh, view, you know, that, that you have an option to actually ignore climate change when in fact, in places like the Philippines, in Bangladesh, in the Pacific Islands, it's already a reality that is inescapable. There's no closing of the laptop or phone or uh, you know, avoiding of the newspaper to ignore uh, and, and to be uh, climate proof, <laughs> in, uh, so to speak, uh, because again, it's part of the reality. And so it's very important that you know, these stories are, are also uh, you know, shared and, and perhaps it's time for quote unquote, the global norm to learn from the global south. I remember a book by Sir Nigel Chris, Chris the, few, the former uh, head of the National Health Service in the UK. The book is entitled Turning the World Upside Down. What can the North learn from the South in terms of improving health systems and global health? And I think that is very much applicable too in, the, in this new arena of, of, of planetary health. Um, you know, I like the telenovela um, suggestion because the Philippines is a telenovela country. We were uh, a Spanish colony for uh, 300 years. In fact, this year we're commemorating the 500th year of Spanish uh, colonization and Hispanization and Catholic and, and the Christian 
organization of the country. So we love telenovelas, but we don't need to fictionalize climate change because as I've said, it's already a reality. But I think we need to tell more uh, the stories, not just of the suffering, but also the resilience of the people. You know, what are the solutions that are, that are, that are out there? Uh, and especially the voices of you know, women. And that's why I deeply admire uh, Nicole's work uh, in Women Leaders for Planetary Health. We actually have a meeting on Friday because we want to bring the program here in Southeast Asia where, you know, there's so much potential for women leadership in planetary health. I think the future of planetary health is female. Finally, I think in as much as it's important to communicate planetary health uh, to the public, to young people, to women, uh, to um, you know, our colleagues, for example, in the North or in the South. I think we also need to start talking about how to uh, share planetary health messages and proposals and recommendations to politicians and government officials, which um, admittedly, you know, they're the ones who have uh, a strong handle over many of the sectoral policies that concern planetary health challenges. And for instance, I just want to share that in Malaysia, where you know, the Sunway Center for Planetary Health is, is located, we already started talking to the Malaysian government in developing a national planetary health strategy that will support Malaysia's ambition to become a zero carbon economy by 2050. And so that I think is, is an exciting opportunity. We really have a close uh, you know, uh, relationship now with government. It's time for us to find those policy and political windows and also find those political allies and then find the right mix of planetary health messaging. You know, and it cannot just be about the problems. We have to offer the solutions. And I think that this COVID moment where, you know, people and politicians alike are now realizing the need for transformation, I think this is a great moment for introducing those, uh, you know, hard and, and ambitious proposals that have never been considered before, uh, but only a COVID-19 pandemic mixed with climate change uh, will, um, you know, kind of present, you know, these, these windows of opportunity. I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Lancel. Uh, we had a discussion, a discussion yes, um, two days ago on Sunday with uh, Maria Neira from the WHO, and um, she is really, uh, <laughs> the, the end of the discussion was that she is going to Glasgow to lose her patience. That was her, her, her wording, to really uh, say how urgent it is. And uh, just to put things into scale, the amount of people dying of air pollution is uh, rarely uh, part of the discussion. And uh, even if the COVID-19 crisis has uh, brought a lot of suffering and damage, the damage and loss of lives due to air pollution each year is, is much higher at all. 13 per minute. Yeah. And nobody's talking about it, that these two crises are interlinked in the way that uh, a lung that has, um, has been uh, forced to breathe bad air is more vulnerable to viruses and stuff. Uh, uh, Tony, uh, just give you, uh, I hand over to you in a minute. I, I love this way of uh, using PowerPoint uh, with the camera. I have to use it again, because this is Detlef Ganten, and he, he's the guy who uh, invented the World Test Summit. And this is a picture, um, I have to hold it like this, yeah. Um, uh, that shows that people who went into basic research, like Detlef, who has been doing hypertension research for decades, now is turning into a really big messenger, messenger of global health, of public health, of, of uh, uh, planetary health. And this is a good example of how we can bridge generations. When we're talking about communication in the session, it's very important to include diverse groups as well as different age groups. Uh, Detlef is uh, now turning 80. This is Luisa Neubauer, the, the head of uh, Fridays for Future in Germany. This is me and this is Silvia Hartmann from a, a network of physicians called Klug Alliance. Of, um, and this is uh, the power that we have when we're doing um, mass demonstration. This was just before COVID. This is in 2019. But they're uh, really a worldwide movement for Fridays for Future. And if you take an existing social movement and connect it with planetary health ideas, then you have much more media attention than if you're trying to do it separately. That's why we had a demonstration in front of the Charité uh, with nurses, with doctors, with this uh, big globe um, showing that climate protection is health protection. 
And the last thing, yeah, uh, this is uh, over to Australia. This is one of the places where there's coal digging in Germany. And I went there one of the hottest days in the year with uh, Teresa Krüger. She's a medical student and she's uh, really into global health and um, uh, she has a great career in front of her. But you have to look once in your life into these holes of Mother Earth to understand the dimension. When we're talking about gases, people don't understand why they're measured in tons. And if you look, this is missing. Where is it? All above us. These are the tons of coal that are missing there, and they're now above us in the atmosphere. You need practical explanations. And last thing, how do you get heat on the paper, on the newspaper? Because heat, when you take a photograph, it's not reported. You can show people sweating. And I thought, why was this um, ice bucket challenge for ALS so uh, uh, such a hit on social media? Because it was a very simple, um, image. And so we took medical students in their white coats, and this is Mother Earth here, and we had a very simple slogan, 42 degrees is equals 112, which means that it's a medical emergency. You call in Germany uh, 112, it's like 999 in, in the ambulance, that uh, you have the image of an uh, emergency and a cooling <laughs> event, and this went uh, on the newspaper, on the, uh, on the television news, because it was a good story to tell it was very easy. If you're talking about heat, talk about how do you get it in the media. And now over to Australia. Uh, when we're talking about um, the victims of the flooding, uh, these were 200 in Germany. We had in Germany alone 20,000 people dying of heat in the year 2018. And this didn't make it into the media. And uh, Tony, um, in Australia, heat and the, the wildfires have had such a immediate impact on human health. How was this um, perceived in, in the media and how could we learn from uh, there how to put heat in the middle of the conversation? Yeah, it's a, it's a really important question, this one, Eckert, because as you say, um, uh, you can't uh, uh, see it. And uh, and it's that means that it's hidden. It doesn't show up as well in the health data either, because it's not always reported as a cause of death. For example, and we tend to focus on the more proximate uh, cause of death um, in this context. So, yeah, it's it's certainly in our country. Um, uh, heat, heat extremes, uh, heat waves are the most deadly of uh, our natural hazards. Um, and uh, in, um, in those uh, summer bushfires, that combination of the smoke and the heat uh, shortened uh, many lives. And uh, so you know, the one of the ways that we're engaging um, uh, with these questions around uh, heat and health is uh, through sport. Uh, we're doing work with both community sport and with elite sport around um, uh, policies to safeguard health. And because um, you know, uh, sport reaches a diverse um, group across society, this can be a, a really um, a positive way of engaging with what's a poorly understood issue. Uh, we're also um, uh, working here in Australia with um, uh, weather um, forecasters at, at Monash in our climate change um, uh, communications group. They've been doing this for some years now in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, uh, you know, when, when there's extremely cold weather, uh, in addition to the temperatures, you also get the wind chill factor. But in the hot weather, we haven't got that nuanced view on um, uh, how hot it would actually feel if you were in the sunshine, because the temperatures are all temperatures in the shade, for example. And then that combination of temperature and humidity, which is so important and such a big issue, of course, in the tropical zone uh, where Renzo is and in Brazil. 
Uh, so, so yeah, a number of questions there. While, while the mic's also open, um, Eckert, I might just add, uh, pick up on some references earlier to different ways of knowing and um, uh, traditional knowledge, indigenous uh, people. I think this is really important because when we're connecting with people about planetary health matters, uh, it's important for us to think about their belief uh, systems and how they might be relevant. For example, uh, Taoist beliefs in China, Ayurveda in India, um, in, in many countries of the world, including the Philippines, um, uh, Catholic religion and the Pope's encyclical, uh, you know, connecting with people uh, through other things that they believe in uh, is really, really important. Because while uh, planetary health is a relatively new term in research and in uh, public policy, it's not a new idea for Indigenous people. You know, these, these are foundational understandings for Indigenous people around the world. People in China, India, elsewhere around the world have understood the connections between nature and health and well-being for millennia. And so as we've modernised, we've detached from some of this knowledge and we need to re-engage with it and we need to, to encourage others to re-engage with it through their other belief systems. Thank you. Tony, there, there are two important groups that you were mentioning, the, the, the sports people who are uh, oftentimes uh, easily uh, uh, yeah, um, overlooked as messengers. For example, we, we just have the case in Germany of one uh, national hero who is uh, denying uh, vaccines. And this is a, <laughs> this is a catastrophe. If, if uh, everybody thinks, well, he, he has uh, access to the best doctors, he is wealthy, if he doesn't uh, trust the, uh, the vaccine, I shouldn't do either. And uh, on the other hand, um, one of the uh, images that I like to use is uh, the lion in the animal kingdom is called the king, but he's forced to stay in the shade once he has tried to... Uh, hunt uh, um, um, whatever, <laughs> some uh, fast running animal. Because uh, the muscles when, you, when you're running, they heat up and the circulation breaks down if you're overheating. And if you're in a hot environment, you can't get the body temperature out. And uh, this is an example that, that uh, and then the lion doesn't have sweat glands like we humans have. And suddenly the king is turned into a slave, so to speak, in this image. And if uh, I talk to um, people from um, the football teams or soccer teams in Germany, I try to get them to get this message across. We run for, as a profession. We run for our lives. We love playing football or fußball. But if the outside temperature rises, we can't do this. And you have no fun in watching us sweating for just the outside temperature. You want to see us sweating for the game. And the, uh, the, the, in, in Germany, the, the Sportschau always starts at a certain time. And in Spain, the National League takes place in the uh, evening because during the day it's too hot. And uh, these are examples where you can immediately draw attention from a completely different audience when you're saying that something that's really dear to them will be changed just because of outside temperature of climate crisis of of, of planetary health issues they they don't have their ritual that the sport game starts at this time and the 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 game can take place this these are simple examples of communication that has been little used to address the majority of the people because we are all in uh, democratic states and we need the majority of people to care about this, not only an elite. 
I suggest you say that to the government of Qatar. When yeah. Have wrote, uh, the <laughs> this next, is the most absurd thing. Yeah. World Economic Forum, the most that's the highest uh, uh, emitting country that the, uh, that exists. On the, it's not the U.S. It's, the, it's Qatar, and, and and so we're going to have problem uh, uh, heat issues. But can I just? I know Tony, you have your hand, but if I can just add one uh, sure. piece of. And then uh, then uh, I, uh, I'm going to read some questions from the. Uh, Oh, we have outside uh, um, audience and, and this audience uh, can participate too, of course. This is one, a very good example. And, and I think when, uh, uh, again, we, there are, you know, I feel that we could this session for many hours because there's so many levels of this, uh, of this message. But uh, on the politician side, I, I recently, uh, last year, I wrote an article called Planetary Health Diplomacy. I think it was also the, the first time we're trying to capture this idea that planetary health needs to go to the to policymakers. And I'm, I'm so happy to see now that, we, you know, not only our colleagues are um, uh, developing this and it's advancing, but for example, uh, I was in, in Brazil recently and you could see we have, uh, I invite all of you to uh, learn more about the Sao Paulo Declaration on Planetary Health. And it was the first time that we... <laughs> Exactly. So there is a video circulating there. Mm -hmm. you're, in, you're in the video. And that was a, a very exciting. We had more, almost 50 countries, and it was a consultation process. We're talking about in, being inclusive, right? So, and diverse. There was a 19 sectors there. So there's, I think, the planetary health uh, narrative and work uh, has a place for everybody. And it's only through this uh, community engagement at all levels that we're going to uh, make the difference. And I could see, but the, the piece of good news is oh, okay, another declaration, which is for our community think was important to have a political document uh, um, emphasizing the role of planetary health. Uh, still, that's how we um, things a bit work uh, also at the UN level. Uh, and we had a concrete document. But in the, now in Brazil, I was there and it was a very interesting to see how um, this was picked up by the main news. So we were mm -hmm. not in the telenovelas, but in the main, uh, which right. I would not expect uh, in Brazil. Bolsonaro was listening. You know, so... <laughs> He, I don't know if he had his TV on, it was there. <laughs> so it was the main, uh, really the main channels and so many others. So not only one, but this was picked up by the media. And now the government, uh, the state, uh, the state of Sao Paulo and people working at the, the government level there wants to talk about planetary health. And that's a very concrete example of how you're is spreading the norm uh, uh, to yeah. policymakers. And finally, also at the, at the UN level was very interesting. Now there's a, after the Sao Paulo declaration, there is a consultation um, that the United Nations Development Program, the UNDP, is now also conducting because they wanted to make planetary health uh, a core area of work uh, in the most <laughs> important. And if you're not talking about planetary health in development, uh, what kind of that's really a shift in paradigm that we need. Yeah. And planetary health is an excellent candidate too. The, the, the diplomacy part is, is, uh, is important. I agree completely. I, uh, yesterday we had a meeting with uh, many foundations concerning uh, climate change and how to move more rich people like uh, the Wellcome Trust, the uh, Gates Foundation, others uh, into the direction of including planetary health ideas in their communication because you have uh, huge institutions that are focusing on one topic and they have a great leverage there. But if you're um, starting to open their minds towards do you see the interconnectedness of this? There, there's much more power in this. Uh, I want to read some of the questions that I'm getting on this iPad. And uh, then I, I've seen your uh, hand up, uh, Tony, you would be next. Maybe you can include some of the topics that are put in here. The current climate change narrative is often focused around its effect of young, on young people and their anxieties about the future. How does this help or hinder the need to communicate about the urgency of climate change action. It is affecting people of all ages right now. It's not a future problem. This is what Eli Paravani is saying. And this uh, touches two topics that I uh, love to include in this talk. What is the effect on mental health? And how do we communicate this to children? Because in a way, you don't want them to panic and to see, think where we're um, uh, they're, they're really um, have no right to grow into confidence that this world is an okay place. But on the other hand, you don't want to lie to them. And uh, so this is, um, these are two topics that I would love to hear um, Tony about and then Renzo. And then we have another movie to illustrate how, how this can, um, yeah, be tackled on, on a new way. 
Tony, how do you deal with the connection of, of for example, heat and the brain? It's a, such a direct uh, um, yeah, impact that uh, with heat, you have uh, more accidents, more suicides, you have uh, less control. Each one of us knows that with heat, you can, can't get a clear thought. But this is also over, overlooked. Uh, if I talk to the psychiatrist or the neurologist, there are no experts on heat and brain. This is ridiculous. Yeah, uh, really important uh, questions here, Eckert. And uh, absolutely, I mean, the first one around young people. And um, uh, I mean, it's, it's wonderful to see young people stepping up uh, around the world. Uh, here uh, in Melbourne, um, Anjali Sharma is a young uh, uh, school uh, child who took our Minister for Environment to court um, in a case about the approval of, of a new coal mine um, here in Australia. And that's proceeding uh, through the courts at the moment uh, the, the, uh, in the first um, uh, judgment. Uh, the judge upheld uh, that uh, the Minister for Environment had a responsibility uh, to consider the well-being of young people, not just in Australia, but around the world from uh, the expansion of coal mines. That's been appealed um, by um, uh, the, uh, the Minister. So essentially, it, it sends a message that the Australian government currently doesn't think they have a duty of care. Uh, to young people in this contract, which is uh, in really quite an extraordinary thing to do, but it's now um, uh, before the full bench of that court and could end up uh, uh, with a further appeal uh, before the High Court. So, you know, um, this is a very uh, significant case, fantastic to see young people stepping up. And uh, the important thing here, though, is that young people don't have a vote. So that you know, that it's it's only in this kind of context, with the support, in this case of an 85-year-old nun um, who is their litigation guardian, that young people uh, can actually voice uh, their concerns. So we certainly don't want to alarm young people, but it's important to remember that young people learn about climate change in school, unlike many of our elected officials in our parliaments. Um, many of them are old enough that they didn't learn about climate change at school and so they have to be prepared to keep learning in the parliament so that they understand the issues that uh, are front of mind um, uh, for young people but you're absolutely right Eckert uh, we tend to focus on the the physical health effects of climate change um, and we don't uh, 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 pay enough attention uh, to the mental health impacts uh, of climate change. This needs more attention. Um, it also relates to displacement of people from places where they live, uh, whether that's um, small uh, uh, Pacific Island countries or, or large cities um, in Delta regions of uh, Southeast Asia. Um, you know, uh, displacement, loss of livelihoods, uh, really important mental health implications. So let me stop there um, and pass back. Yeah, thank you. Um, what, what's the view of the Philippines, Renzo? <laughs> well, it's not just the view of the Philippines, but the view of young people uh, yeah. like me, but also the view of uh, some of the most vo uh, uh, pop uh, some of the most affected populations uh, in the world, in Southeast Asia, in the Pacific. I mean, you know, there's a latest study that showed that 92% of young people in the Philippines are frightened about the climate crisis. Uh, and, you know, that's coming from a country that has already been frequented by extreme weather events like typhoons and flooding on, on even a monthly basis. Uh, and and pe young people are also uh, concerned about the failures of, of government uh, in, in responding, in preparing, in mitigating uh, this crisis. So, you know, the young people are very aware it's not just going to affect how they play football. It is actually an issue of survival, long-term survival. Will they have jobs in the next 50 years? Will they uh, be able to even survive uh, beyond, uh, you know, 50 years old because, well, you know, they, they might be experiencing either extreme weather events like typhoons or, um, you know, in uh, exposure to extreme heat? 
eat? Uh, will their siblings uh, pass the age of five? Uh, be, uh, because uh, climate change is also going to lead to an increase in vector-borne, mosquito-borne, water-borne, food-borne diseases. So these are um, real issues that are affecting everyday people's lives. And that's why we need uh, to engage the young people now who will be uh, leaders today and tomorrow. You know, they're quite concerned about the planet that they will be inheriting from the many adults uh, and, and many adult leaders of the world who should know better. Uh, and what are some of the uh, opportunities here? Um, you know, we, we're talking about teaching uh, planetary health to children. We actually co-published an, an editorial in The Lancet last year about making sure planetary health is, is included uh, in the curriculum, K to 12. But I think, and we were just discussing recently, I just got appointed uh, in the country's uh, mini IPCC, and we were discussing that climate education should be included throughout the life course, you know, from cradle to grave, because adults as well do still play a key role in their respective professions and sectors. How do they consider climate change uh, aspects uh, in agriculture, in the health system, in transport, in many affairs of our um, of our of our society. So, so definitely, education uh, will will need to play a, a key role, and and we need to make sure that uh, we apply a, a, an intersectional lens. You know, uh, that that we acknowledge the different layers of, of vulnerability and and inequality. You know, it, it we can't come up with a, a one size fits all kind of education for all uh, young people or adults. You know, there are specific communities that are more uh, affected by the climate climate crisis, indigenous peoples, uh, people with disabilities, the elderly, uh, women and children, uh, farmers and fisher folks who are in the front lines of the climate crisis. So, so I think we need to make sure that, uh, you know, when we talk about preparing the next generation, we apply uh, these principles uh, of, of intersectionality uh, and really having a broad view uh, that, that it's really about people's uh, health and well-being and survival in the long run. Thank you. Yeah, and, and the, the people you just mentioned are very, literally, uh, uh, very um, rarely uh, in, in the media with, with these uh, issues. Uh, there's a question from the audience, please. Who are you and, and what's, what do you want to know? Hi, hello, my name is Stephanie Taché. I'm a primary care physician and a global health um, practitioner. First of all, thank you very much for having this session. Um, and particularly, it's focusing on communication. Uh, and I, my question is for all the pa panelists, uh, particularly in the spirit of uh, clarity, uh, we see that even here at this conference, there are different uh, terms being used, global health, one health, echo health, and now we have planetary health. And I was just uh, wondering from all the panelists whether there have been discussions on um, some of the organizational principles of having planetary health be an overall framework. Um, for these other topics, particularly uh, because there's implications for funding uh, and uh, policymakers, so that we're not once again repeating silo approaches within these different disciplines. Thank you. Should I? Okay, so that's a question that we should always be prepared for because we, I think we're getting a, and it's a very important one. Uh, every session, I think people are curious about the terms. I, I, I personally think that we um, sometimes we also get a bit lost in semantics, right? And this definitions and, uh, but what is important for me and uh, less than, and perhaps the importance is because there are implications for funding, for example, but to me, the planetary health approach is the most um, that, Kind of more uh, comprehensive in a sense that uh, it's not an excluding approach, right? Uh, and also, it's part of this. Uh, I also, in the book, I discuss is we have equal health, one health, uh, geo health. Uh, when uh, planetary health came in 2017, I remember there was planetary health slash geo health. So um, I see perhaps a difference. And I think other people here in the room can also uh, explain that even better than me. And uh, uh, people, are, I'm uh, my expertise in international affairs. So the way I join planetary health was through uh, One Health and uh, doing, uh, I lived in Thailand, so also in projects uh, of uh, new emerging infectious diseases. Uh, and what I learned, uh, and I think it's, it's not the truth, but what I learned that the One Health approach had a lot of uh, 
the community also presenting uh, that uh, and, and raising awareness and consciousness uh, has a lot to do with, the, with infectious disease, the veterinarians uh, bringing this, you cannot help human health uh, uh, without um, the health of animals and, and the planet. So I think the Planetary Health Now movement is expanding that uh, the communities and like I said, bringing everybody, not everybody uh, connected to uh, infectious diseases, for for example, but um, I'm also curious to see how our colleagues are defining. Yeah, there, there was one uh, attendee saying, um, agreeing on the fact that we're tackling multiple pandemics at the time, besides the ones mentioned. Uh, do you think that antibiotic resistance can be considered one of such pandemics, mostly in light its effect on both humans, animals and environmental health? Um, sure. Uh, this the, the biodiversity aspect has to be part of the planetary health. And uh, the one and that's, and that's why it's so yeah. interesting. That's why I said a passion for planetary health is this possibility of inclusion. And I, and I, I when at some point I also write that you everybody, if you're interested in sustainability or health and, and these other topics, you're doing planetary health. Perhaps you don't call it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why the effort here is more than uh, trying to oh, define in a closed uh, way is uh, expand our visions, what is needed uh, to, to deal with human health. And I think that's the role of having planetary health in this forum here. And I love when they say, yesterday I wasn't a session, I'm not a health expert. And that's great because if you only have health <laughs> experts here, and I feel very, you know, because I'm also not a health expert, but but, uh, but I'm moving and I think that's the message also that we need to be brave to get out of our own disciplines to connect to other colleagues to actually propose a solution that is truly transdisciplinary and the difference here is that when, when we were saying transdisciplinary is when we also including uh, there's a lot of discussion about transdisciplinary is a lot of papers that but in a simple way is how do we include, include communities sometimes we go as researchers to a community and we assume that we know their problems so um, the key point is uh, co-create knowledge there are different ways of, of knowing as uh, Tony was also saying uh, and planetary health brings uh, this possibility I want to show you a little movie that we just did at, uh, I have to apologize, it's only in German, I will dub it simultaneously. The reason why I'm showing this is uh, you questioned about where does the money come from? And uh, we just had an election in Germany and uh, I, I, I did the, 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 the journey the other way around. I started as a physician, as a medical doctor, then I thought, well, why, why, are not, uh, why aren't we applying more of the knowledge that we have and, and the research uh, on, on prevention and public health. Then I turned into uh, science communicator. And now uh, we're addressing together with Healthy Planet, Healthy People, the politicians uh, directly and indirectly. Uh, so <laughs> I'm not an expert. It's a, <laughs> the, the next time somebody says in the talk show, I'm not an expert on this, they great. <laughs> that's, that's something I learned from, uh, from you, Nicole. Um, we want to show you the movie just to give you an example of how you can put up more political pressure. This is part that the, the basic line is called the most expensive thing that we, uh, that we can do now is nothing. It's like a paradoxic, uh, paradoxical intervention because uh, we're talking about a lot of how do we get money for, uh, for vaccinations? How do we raise money for uh, climate um, protection and stuff, instead of what are the costs of inaction? What are the costs of doing nothing? And this is uh, our example of turning the discussion around instead of talking about where, where does the money come from? What are we losing with each year that we're not acting? And uh, I will try to uh, give you the, end, uh, the idea in English while we're watching the German, the uh, introduction of the German movie, please. Wir reden übers Impfen. Aber über welche Impfung genau? Über die dritte Impfung für We're die erste Welt oder über die uh, erste Impfung für die dritte Welt? Welt? Gute Frage. Exactly Aber eigentlich gibt es nur eine Welt. Pandemie heißt ja überall. Und eine Pandemie ist erst dann zu Ende, wenn alle Menschen weltweit, global Zugang zu Impfstoffen hatten. Da sind wir noch weit weg von. Wir können es uns nicht leisten, weiter nichts zu tun. Ah, die Pandemie war doch schon teuer Nothing genug. 500 anymore. Milliarden alleine für Deutschland, alleine für 2020 und 2021 oder auch 100 Duplo-Steine. Das ist der Schaden für Deutschland und das hier 
schlappe 20 Milliarden hätten gereicht, um COVAX zu unterstützen. COVAX ist eine internationale Impfinitiative. Und die haben gesagt, lass uns dann ein Drittel der Bevölkerung in den ärmsten Ländern der Erde impfen. Gerade zum Beispiel Gesundheitsberufe. Das hätte mega viele Menschenleben gerettet. Und dass wir das nicht hingekriegt haben, ich finde es peinlich. Ja, aber diese 20 Milliarden, die fehlen uns doch woanders, oder? Die fehlen, das sind Peanuts für uns. Weißt du, wofür 20 Milliarden ausgegeben werden? In diesel Subventionen und für Flugbenzinsubventionen. Also blöder kann man Geld nicht ausgeben. Ich zeig dir mal, warum es sich lohnt, gerade in Impfen global zu investieren. Impfen ist sinnvoll, sicher und solidarisch. Aber global betrachtet ist Impfen einfach nur eins. Total ungerecht. Katharina, wie sieht das global aus? 5 Milliarden Ungeimpfte, 3 Milliarden Geimpfte. Und es gibt Länder, zum Beispiel auf dem afrikanischen Kontinent, wo nicht mal 2 Prozent der Bevölkerung geimpft sind. Sind 98 Prozent Impfgegner? Vermutlich nicht. <lacht> Nein, ich wäre froh, wenn sie Zugang zu Impfstoffen hätten. Aber das liegt auch daran, dass die westlichen Länder, die Reichen, den für sich gebunkert haben. Mehr als wir eigentlich brauchen. Auch das wieder nicht so schlau. Ein plakatives Beispiel. And the, das hier sind die Viren, das ist der Impfschutz. The und wer ist davon geschützt? Momentan purple, nur die Menschen uh, im globalen Norden. The, um, und da, wo die um, Viren ungeheimt sich ausbreiten können, entstehen neue Formen, nämlich sogenannte Mutationen. Und die können dann zum Beispiel unseren Impfstoff plötzlich And then the mutations can open die klare Lektion von Covid-19, um, Pandemie bedeutet, wir sind erst dann alle sicher, wenn idea alle of getting sicher the idea sind. Across, that, uh, global health is here, global health is infectious and we can uh, do more to protect our own health Die Klimakrise ist mit Abstand die money. größte Gesundheitsgefahr im 21. Jahrhundert. Und deswegen müssen wir insbesondere die Menschen they, im globalen Süden stärken, on, uh, weil die der Sache besonders stark ausgesetzt sind und weil die besonders verletzlich sind. 0,7% uh, für Entwicklungszusammenarbeit. 0,1% like, uh, für globale Gesundheit. Das ist unser Ziel. Man kann nicht sagen, dass wir uns das nicht leisten können. Zusammengefasst, das teuerste, was wir jetzt tun können, ist nichts. And 0.1, and the, it says that the, the most expensive thing that we can do now is nothing. And we have this uh, cake, and I show that 0.1 is one thousandth part of what we have to give. And it's just this little piece of cake that we're not given, uh, not even achieving in Germany. And and I think it, you need practical. Movies like we made it with a company that usually does commercial movies. You have to have more professional communication about these topics, otherwise you won't get uh, um, the message across to to a broader audience and the politicians themselves. And uh, on this uh, topic, I want to thank the um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who was supporting us in this. Um, give them a hand. <laughs> So uh, over to um, Australia and uh, your best examples of uh, communicating these uh, topics to a um, um, bigger audience. We have uh, 10 minutes left in our discussion and we want to focus on the, the next steps. What uh, are the um, chances of uh, the Glasgow COP? What are the chances in communicating planetary health together with the climate crisis, together with uh, biodiversity crisis? And um, yeah, uh, give us some hope, <laughs> Renzo. <and, laughs> um, yeah, well, um, yeah, no, uh, it's very important that we always do remain hopeful. And I think um, uh, the source of hope uh, that I see is the way um, Uh, Australian people, not necessarily um, all our elected officials in our parliament, but the way Australian people want stronger action on climate change. And, uh, and that is clear from all of the surveys um, of the views of Australian people. And importantly, um, uh, Australian people want action on climate change because it will not only be good for uh, our health in the future, but because it will provide new uh, economic opportunities for young Australians. Because if we try and hold on to 
uh, these traditional ways of doing things, whether it's burning coal to make energy or uh, any of the traditional ways uh, of doing things that are harming uh, our climate and our environment, then we're only going to be left behind. So embracing new possibilities, uh, our working together uh, with partners uh, around the world, across uh, uh, sectors, uh, industry, civil society, uh, that's, uh, that's the positive story. And we're seeing that. Uh, sadly, our leaders aren't uh, out in front. Uh, they're, they're struggling to keep up at the moment. Yeah, and that this is uh, something that uh, I'm looking forward at COP, uh, that Andrew Haynes, the, the godfather of, of planetary health, uh, he has always stressed the, um, in the communication the co-benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for example, when we are seeing many people suffering from uh, um, uh, heavy COVID-19, there are often people who have uh, another health problem, like overweight, like, um, yeah, um, um, diabetes and stuff. So prevention, uh, together with uh, the resilient health system, is uh, one of the things we have to really focus on and, and bring the climate community to this uh, evident conclusion that uh, when you have a hospital without uh, the chance of cooling it down, uh, you will lose patients. They, they are suffering even within the, the, the buildings. So this is the, the, the situation we are now facing and it's getting worse over the next decade. And uh, the, invest, uh, the, the amount of money that we need to transform this is huge. But uh, if we don't do it, uh, um, anyway. it will get more expensive. Um, Paula, what are you, um, Nicole, what are you uh, <laughs> looking forward at COP? What, when, um, what do you think? would be the best communicative oh. outcome from COP? The best. Um, we want ambition, right? Uh, yeah. We know uh, that so that's, uh, which is hard to be, it's hard to remain hopeful because, uh, you know, we cannot be here. It's not wishful thinking, as I said, the geopolitics. And that's, I think, a bit of my expertise. Uh, that's what is um, leaving us behind. But I remain hopeful because we are unstoppable now. And we see the, the topic, it's, it's impossible to not talk about uh, this, about climate change or about biodiversity diversity uh, uh, loss or uh, ocean. Uh, we, we tend to forget, but the, 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 now we see how the only reason that we are still at somehow you know, functioning is because of our nature. Mm. Uh, so we need to restore nature. To, so what I'm hopeful is to bring this uh, communities of climate also to the biodiversity one. And yes. I see a, a, a bigger chance now. But I wanted to also make a proposal since we are uh, closing and we talk about the subsidies. And I'm also a scientific commissioner of the Pathfinder Initiative and working with Andy Haynes. And we're going to have a session at the COP. Mm -hmm. So one is the, at the EU pavilion. So I invite all of you on Monday uh, to attend the session and to first week or second week. Uh, it's the first uh, first week for, uh, for um, me too. So <laughs> we can continue the conversation there. Uh, but um, the first of November, we're going to have an assigned event exactly on the health benefits yeah. uh, and explaining the Pathfinder. I invite all of you. Yesterday there was a session here that we can watch on YouTube on a higher speed, so we save time. So I heard that you, <laughs> you don't need higher speed. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's just a tip for us to, to do even more um, with less resources. Um, but um, what I um, what I would like to highlight here was I'm, um, I make a proposal because we are concluding is I heard a lot about a new uh, pandemic treaty. Right. Um, there's a in principle, I think that's an interesting idea and we should uh, explore. However, there is another treaty that we are proposing that there are, it's also on this initial so the fossil fuel non proliferation treaty which is also about our health. And, and we should also, if we're talking about um, a pandemic treaty, we need to talk about uh, the reduction of coal and yeah. gas. It's uh, the most uh, imminent threat to our health. So climate change is an opportunity for public health. And having this conversation, so perhaps next, next year at the World Health Summit, we're gonna have a conversation of the pandemic treaty, of the fossil fuel non-proliferation uh, treaty, because we learned, and right now we have colleagues uh, that works also, uh, Dermid at the World Health Organization cycling to Glasgow, bringing a letter, <laughs> and I invite also, you can see on Twitter, he's, I think he reached London yesterday, 850 <laughs> kilometers. I'm jealous because I don't think I could do this. <laughs> but uh, he's bringing this healthy recovery letter signed by more than 45, 45 yeah. 
million health professionals. And that's helpful. I think I don't think before uh, this professor yeah. would be engaged. So these things are changing and that's exciting. And another thing is we see that uh, you talked about subsidies, right? I, apparently we have $11 million per minute uh, of subsidies. Uh, the IMF has uh, the numbers. So if we use our money in a smart way in with through budgets that I think we have a very uh, good chance to save money and save lives. And uh, <laughs> this session will be on, on uh, uh, YouTube faster. YouTube. And if you <laughs> want to listen to it, Nicola Paula slower, you can <laughs> also you <do>. use the <laughs> settings. <laughs> I've never done that. <laughs> so I know I reached a point that I just imagine zero said, can we go faster? Because I think you got used to it and the topics were quite aware. People tend to repeat their points. <laughs> so, uh, but which is important for advocacy, but I think you're in the field. Uh, I think we got the message. I just imagine you spread. talking uh, Portuguese. We're not getting into this. <laughs> we have two more uh, closing remarks. Uh, Renzo, please, what, what are your signs of hope? And what sure. are you watching at, uh, at the COP? And yeah, and, and and quite frankly, you know, my vision is beyond COP, right? I've, on, 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 on one part, I was thinking, you know, that's done deal. We already know what they're going to talk about. And, and uh, maybe this is my less optimistic side. But I think um, we in the planetary health community so, should go beyond COP. You know, Nico, Nico, Nicole was already mentioning about uh, forging uh, coalitions with the biodiversity sector and, and planetary health. Uh, going back to the earlier discussion, what is the added value of planetary health? It really breaks the silos. It transcends disciplinary boundaries. But I think planetary health is also an opportunity to discuss issues that we are afraid to talk about, to discuss and, and really grapple with some of the fundamental questions of our civilization that we are not talking about even in places like the World Health Summit. The funny thing is in 2019, I actually wrote a commentary saying that, you know, basically suggesting or recommending that the World Health Summit should become the Planetary Health Summit if it wants to really, you know, up its level of ambition. And one of these areas that we're not talking about is the future of our economy. Right now we have an economy that destroys the planet that widens inequalities, that does not equitably distribute vaccines, especially to the, to the places and peoples that, that need them the most. So that is the kind of economy that we have. And we are having these discussions about addressing climate change, protecting biodiversity, preventing the next pandemic, without talking about how we're going to redesign the economy that created these problems in the first place. You know, I remember during the start of the pandemic, there's a lot of excitement about, oh, what's the new economic blueprint for the post-COVID future? All those discussions have already died down because now we're yeah. all obsessed with the vaccines and, and the, uh, the, the current system. I think, and, you know, to close my, my remarks, you know, and I, I have an article coming up very soon on this, you know, of course, in this day and age of COVID-19, we realize we need more PPEs, right? Personal protective equipment. I think yeah. that the other PPE that we need is what I call a people and planet centered economy. That is the PPE that we're not talking about because of our obsession with the short term and with, uh, with, with our uh, ignorance and neglect of the fundamental questions that underpin our civilization. I'll yeah. stop there. We're Thank you. We're looking forward to this article. And so <laughs> we, we just had a, a great remark from um, um, Professor of One Health in, in Ghana. He said, uh, what's wrong with the economy? You can uh, use a very simple uh, example, as long as you earn more when you cut down the tree and turn it into a <laughs> IKEA cupboard, instead of having a living tree with roots that is uh, doing photosynthesis, you will never st uh, stop cutting trees. We have to turn around the value of nature-based solutions. We have to acknowledge what planetary health is based on. It's clean air, it's water, it's something to eat, some plants that grow, and you can never invent a drug or machine that's capable of doing this, what nature does all the time without asking for a bill. But if we don't invest now, we are all paying the bill. Uh, Tony, your last words from Australia. What's giving you hope and uh, will you be uh, at COP? Uh, yes, we'll be uh, virtually engaging with COP, which is, of course, uh, less carbon emissions, which uh, is important. And I guess for me, 
uh, shining light from the pandemic. This is a, a theme from the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development, that recent report. And I think this is encouraging that we, uh, as we regroup and move forward together around the world, how do we bring new insight, new light uh, to the way we do things? And for me, the key uh, to positive change will be to be more planetary conscious in what we do, to be conscious of the planet in all of the work we do uh, in the summit itself yeah. here, in uh, health policy, health research, um, the way we practice health, be conscious of the planet. I think that's a fundamental change we need to see. Yeah, thank you, thank very you much. Tony. And, and uh, one thing that I uh, learned at uh, playing impro theater, there's one golden rule, don't be afraid of the obvious. Just because it's obvious to us, it's not obvious to uh, many other people. So I, uh, I conclude with uh, three little examples of what I think changed communication already. This was the idea of, of using the color stripes for uh, uh, showing people in a very simple and artistic manner. So we have to talk about how can we use graphics, how can we use cartoons, how can we use uh, funny people to get this idea across that it loses a bit of its gravity. And uh, there's, there's Cranky Uncle, there's Catherine Hayhoe in the US, there are, uh, who, who, uh, she's using the whole metaphors of, of the belief systems of people, uh, addressing people's hopes and faith is a very concern uh, to many people and this uh, so oftentimes is opposed to science but if you're uh, um, talking to people of christianity or muslim or uh, hindu faith whatever uh, there's always this idea of planetary health implanted in the religion to to take care and the other really basic idea is uh, everybody loves their children everybody wants them to be healthy and uh, when we're um talking, and this is what I loved about the Lancet's Climate Countdown. They had a movie out, every child will be affected by what we do now. And this is much more emotional than talking about the year 2050 or 2100, this always seems far away. But a child born today will be only 29 at the year 2050 when we are hopefully have reached climate neutrality. But if not, uh, the life that this child is looking forward to have is unimaginable for all of us. So make it uh, precise, make it emotional, make it blunt, <laughs> make it obvious. Don't be afraid of the obvious, even if you're a science communicator. And now I would like to thank Isabel Auer. She was preparing this session and Kerstin Bloom uh, from Healthy Planet, Healthy People. And we have a planet here. And I would love to have one photograph of this session with a planetary health idea. Please come forward. Uh, Nicole, we will have a discussion uh, later on and uh, we'll continue this as COP. I thank you very much for the questions that you post on the internet. I thank you very much for being here and be sure that you become the most burning climate planetary health communicator yourself. Don't wait for others to communicate. You can start just with your iPhone that you're using now. Share this pic, follow us on Instagram share the community empower women uh, please and thank you very much